Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our panel about migration. Um, it is an event that is organized and hosted by LENA. LENA is the association of leading European newspapers um, that try, try to stick together in difficult times. I know that very well because my background is also media background. I'm CEO of Axel Springer. It's a Berlin-based media company, mainly online media. And um, of course, we are in the center of the discussion of this very important and relevant topic, immigration, the so-called refugee crisis. Almost everybody calls this a crisis, although we know that uh, every crisis bears an opportunity. But nevertheless, we have uh, to take the challenges very serious. I personally think that this huge wave of immigration, which is nowhere as um, obvious than in Germany, where we have per day up to 10,000 new uh, immigrants, uh, that this situation is uh, providing Euro Europe with probably the biggest uh, challenge, the biggest danger in its history. I really think it has the potential to blow up Europe, to destroy Europe, but at the same time it also has the potential to strengthen Europe, to shape European values, to strengthen European values, and to benefit on various fronts culturally and business-wise from new citizens in the various countries. We have a very distinguished, distinguished uh, panel here, which is so far incomplete. Uh, Deputy Chancellor Sigmar Gabriel uh, is going to be about 10 minutes late, but we have no time to be polite, so we decided to start without him. So if I may introduce our panel from right, no, from left to right from your point of view, it is uh, Prime Minister of Sweden, Stefan Löwen. It is um, William Lacey Swing, Director General of the International Organization for Migration, based in Geneva. It is Hamdi Ulukaya, CEO and founder of the biggest, or one of the biggest yogurt producers in the United States, Kobani, and uh, not only he himself has an immigrant story coming from uh, Turkey, but he's also employing a lot of immigrants. We have um, uh, Prime Minister of Serbia, Alexander uh, Vucic, um, who has made uh, a lot of experiences with refugees, particularly after the breakup of Yugoslavia. And we have really, from the very grounded perspective of uh, uh, a place where the problems really have to be solved. We have um, Simone Boll, who is working here in Davos in the Sozialdienst Gemeinderat, uh, who is really dealing on a daily basis with refugees in Davos. This morning, a very influential diplomat and publisher died in London, Lord Weidenfeld, at the biblical age of 96. He himself was a refugee. He escaped Vienna as a Jew in 39. He escaped and went to London. He was basically saved by a very religious Protestant family and he made then a tremendous career as a publisher, as one of the founding fathers of the State of Israel, as the chief of staff of Chaim Weizmann, and has lived a life that was very much driven by the idea of tolerance to do everything to avoid racism and another Holocaust again. And uh, Lord Weidenfeld wrote in his, or said in his last interview, that was just published a couple of days before he died, that he's deeply worried about the development of the refugee crisis because he thinks that if Europe is not integrating well this tremendous inflow of new inhabitants coming from very different cultures, sharing other values than most of the European Christian, Judeo-Christian societies, that this could be very dangerous for Europe and for the values of Europe. 
a surprising, somehow worrying statement, and I wanted to ask uh, Prime Minister Löwen first, do you share that worry, or is he exaggerating? How do you see the situation? Uh, well, first, um, uh, to pick up on what you said in the beginning, I, I think it's right, this is, a, this is a very serious situation for Europe and the European Union, because clearly we haven't been able to, to handle this situation in a, in a very good way. Uh, it is a crisis. Uh, so many people are refugees uh, fleeing. Uh, but of course, uh, and of course we need to, to first make sure, not first, but also to make sure that we can help them not having to flee. That's a European Union task as well. Uh, but when they come to Europe and the European Union, we should have been able to cooperate among 28 member states, which we haven't so far. I think we have three or four or five countries that have taken the vast, uh, the, the big, biggest part of this responsibility, and that is not sustainable. So I think, I believe this is very risky. Uh, so we need a new system. Uh, Sweden has taken a large uh, uh, responsibility in this, but uh, when we reached uh, uh, a number of that was, that equals to an annual number, in, in October, November, we had a pace that equals to an annual number of half a million a year. So we reached a stage when we, when we could see that this is not sustainable for the Swedish society. But I, at the same time, I, I was very sad because we, I know at the same time that the European Union with 500 million inhabitants could have coped if we had cooperated. And another perspective, and that is, I think, to, to answer your, your question, if I, if I got it right, is now when, all, when the people are here and, and those have been approved asylum, let's say in Sweden, yes, of course, if we do not use that in, in the right way, that will be a problem for the society because these people, as well as all the people that are, are born in, in Sweden, they need a job, they need housing, they need education. So basically we, we have the same needs, of course, as human beings. But we also need to see that these people that come to our country, countries are individuals because we tend to have been regarding them as a group with the same need. What can we do for them? Well, it's not that easy. What can we do for you and you and you and you? Because we have people coming from Syria, doctors, engineers, nurses, uh, which we could be much, much better to make sure that they can, they can work as doctors, engineers, and nurses in Sweden as well. But we also have those with very, very low uh, education, very low. They need a totally different uh, uh, support. Uh, perhaps on, on the job practice uh, combined with education and, and whatever. So we need to see that, yes, uh, there are some basic, similar needs, but there are also individual needs. And if we do not do this in the right way, we, we waste uh, human capacity. It's a waste. And I'm basically very happy to say that I'm prime minister in a country that is growing. I would be more sad if, if the country is shrinking, but we need to cope. Thank you very much. Prime Minister Vucic, from your perspective, Serbia. Did Serbia, if you look back, let's say, uh, during the last decades, did, did Serbia benefit from this outstanding influx of, of immigrants? What do you mean about it? Economy, is, did the economy benefit from that? Did no. the um, science, uh, scientific <coughs> and cultural life benefit from that? What, what is your, basically, what is your uh, assessment on the uh, integration of immigrants in Serbia? Is this a success story or is it still a kind of unsolved problem? There are no many immigrants in our country. There are no many people that would like to stay in our country because we are a relatively poor country. We are not a very rich country as Germany, Sweden, Netherlands, Austria and some other countries are. But I want to tell you that we showed our solidarity, we showed our human face. And I think that we are the only country on that Balkan route in which you couldn't see a single bullet of tear gas. We didn't harm any single refugee. 
we are in the habit of taking refugees for last hundreds of years. And I'm a son of refugee to them. I'm a prime minister of Serbia. My father came from Bosnia as a war refugee, you know, and today I'm a prime minister of Serbia. And people of Serbia, they always were very compassionate and they always show their empathy towards immigrants. But I wanted to go back, if you allow me, Matthias, uh, to your first question. And there were some recent events and we got new messages from Austria and there are some new decisions in Central Europe. And you know, it goes from Austria to Slovenia, from Slovenia to Croatia, from Croatia to Serbia, from Serbia to Macedonia. And then tonight we have for the first time uh, Macedonians close the border at least for the last two hours. We'll see what will happen tomorrow uh, at Macedonian Greek border. And uh, we have already sent some of our policemen and Slovenians and Austrians and Hungarians as well, all the others down there to help them out. But I'm not sure that that would be the best possible solution. I see that many countries in Europe, they do their best to find their own solution. They see some examples and some politicians see some examples that the other politicians raise their popularity using that isolation policy, which I don't think it's good. And from my point of view, if you allow me, I think that EU migration policy requires changes. And I also think that we need to see decisive and de determined politics on that issue, which we haven't seen so far. And to tell you the truth, you can speak about European Union solutions, but we don't see them. We, are, we have just opened first chapters on our EU path, but I can tell you that, you know, there are some countries in, within European Union which wanted to be more European than Germany, than Sweden, than Netherlands, when they got their money. But when they, when they had to deliver on something, when they had to take some uh, tough measures, and when they had to show solidarity, they didn't show that. But, but we need to, we'll do what European Union will require from us. But, but you said something very interesting uh, at the beginning. You said uh, that Serbia has these days not too many refugees that really want to stay because it's, as you said, I think a small country and not so attractive for the refugees. Yes. Sweden and Germany are super attractive uh, because of their high social welfare uh, uh, system and goods and uh, other aspects. So um, how do we deal with this matter? I mean, if, uh, is, is it possible that we have to adjust somehow uh, social welfare systems in order to distribute it more equally? That would ah, now we have uh, the vice chancellor. Hello, Zygmunt. Just perhaps a short answer, we will come back to that later. Just, just, wanted, just wanted to say, of course, we can't reach the level of uh, Sweden and Germany within 60, 70 years, but uh, we were in favor of quota system. Even as non-EU country, we were ready to accept our quota. And we were ready to accept it more than even Croatia and Slovenia altogether. And mm -hmm. that's what I said in Brussels to Angela Merkel and to all the others. Yeah. But the problem was not with us. The problem was within the European Union. And there is nothing hidden there. Because when you, when you got to those uh, Visegrad group countries and some other countries, they didn't want to get any of those people. And that's, the, and that's a problem today. What we're going to face tomorrow at that Macedonian Greek border, nobody knows. Nobody knows. And we, just, and we need as soon as possible to get that comprehensive and decisive solution done by European Union, otherwise we'll, face, we'll all face a lot of difficulties. Today, just to inform the public audience here, uh, we have averagely 1,818 people in last month. But from 15th of March, we'll have more than 5,000 per day. Yep. And then we'll have a huge problem once again. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Um, now, uh, uh, Minister Gabriel, uh, just three days ago, uh, uh, we had a conversation with uh, Jean-Claude Juncker, 
and he admitted that the distribution of refugees in Europe is so far a total failure. I mean, there was a resolution that 180,000 refugees should be distributed among European uh, EU member countries, and uh, so far, he said, uh, 280 have been distributed. If it's ongoing like that, that's a, a project for uh, many decades. Uh, what can be done to somehow balance uh, this better in order to integrate better in the end? First of all, I would beg your pardon that I'm late because I was in the traffic and there was maybe the city is a little bit too small for so many visitors, I don't know. Uh, all of them are refugees. So, 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 um, uh, so to be very honest and very frank, I do not think that we will come to a European solution where we we'll, can distribute uh, refugees which came to Greek islands or to Italy all over the member states of the European Union. I, I do not see any willingness in the majority of the countries and what we saw today that Austria decided to come to a quota system which will create a lot of debates on the border to Germany and the border to um, <clears throat> Southeast European countries is the signal that Sweden, uh, Germany and Austria are not able to uh, solve the refugee issue for themselves. So what's, what's our proposal or what, what we try to do is, first of all, I think what Europe, Europe must do, and which has nothing to do but with distribution of refugees, is to invest in the living conditions of refugees in the neighborhood, in the neighbor states of Syria, in Lebanon, in Jordan, and in Turkey. I mean, I, I visited some refugee camps, some in Jordan. People told me that there were, was no debate until summer of last year to, to, to go to Europe and to Germany. But when the World Food Bro Program cut the budget per capita from $27 to $13, because they did not enough money from the international community, and when the UN High Commissioner for Refugees had to close hospitals and schools, then of course family discussed uh, how they can save their children. So first of all, we have to um, invest much more in the living conditions. And uh, as Europeans, we should aware that a country like the Lebanon, I think they have around about 5 million inhabitants and more than 1 million mm -hmm. refugees, and it's a poor country. Uh, so sometimes we, uh, when I see how we are debating in Europe, yeah. uh, it's a shame on, on us. Uh, but but I mean, more concretely, if you really take these Juncker figures, uh, shouldn't uh -huh. we then put more pressure also on the member countries? I mean, Juncker was complaining, saying everybody goes to Brussels, is uh, making uh, decisions and resolutions, and then they go home and do something differently. Yep. I mean, with 280 uh, uh, refugees distributed in a couple of months, it's not going to work. Now the second is to make pressure on Europe to protect the borders and to cooperate with Turkey. And the third is to form a coalition of the willing with the European member states to come to quotas and contingents, bigger ones, not only 10 or 20,000, more some 100,000 refugees, because if you, we, you have an um, agreement with Turkey that they will help to protect the European borders, it's, it's, it, it's only possible if you, we, Europe will be so, fa so fair to say, okay, we will take every year some 100,000 refugees mm. from Turkey to Europe, and they have not, not, I, I do not, I don't think that we will distribute them all over Europe. Maybe some countries will agree, but not, not every country. And I have no hope uh, to convince in a short time the Polish government, the East European government, and the French government. They are confronted much more than Germany, and we are learning our lessons every day, with national political movements. And they are afraid that too many refugees are um, like a, a booster for the national movements like Front National in France or the Swedish Democrats in Sweden. And so we will not find a lot of partners by distributing the refugees, but 
investing in the neighbor states of Syria, protecting and controlling the borders of Europe, and there the member states mm -hmm. must be able to mm -hmm. do so. And the third, to take over contingents every year, yeah. uh, and it has the, the, the uh, advantage for refugees that they are not pushed to sell all their money to smugglers and to risk their lives by coming to Europe. So these three pillars, support in the neighborhood of Syria, protecting the borders and taking over bigger contingents from some 100,000 refugees every year, this is what we try to okay. negotiate. Thank you very much, that's very concrete. Now, William Swing, you gave an interview to Die Welt uh, yesterday, and the headline was, Merkel is a visionary in the open border. So Merkel is a visionary of the open borders. Um, you were very, very um, positive about the um, German policy on that matter, a lot of compliments. Are there really no limits, or is there a moment uh, when even Germany could be tempted or could have good reasons to set limits like Austria did today. Um, thank you very much. First of all, I'm, I think the, the Vice Chancellor and the, prime, and the two Prime Ministers have set the scene very well. I, I'm very much in agreement with your analysis of the situation. I mean, I do, I think it is much less a challenge to be met than a human reality that has to be managed. And right now, we don't have the policies to manage it, as Vice Chancellor said. I mean, what I, I, by the way, I, the headline is slightly wrong. I, I did the interview. I think that maybe it lost something in translation. But I, I, what I said, I praised and expressed admiration for what I thought was a politically courageous and visionary statement by, by Chancellor Angela Merkel. The problem was it's a crisis of, it's a systemic crisis. Sweden followed, Austria followed, and that was the end of the story. So all the pressure has come back on Germany. I said, we, we never preach open borders. Clearly, a country has to uh, make its own decisions in that regard. But it is a systemic crisis. Uh, the figures that have already been given, we, we need a change in perception. A million people within a 550 million uh, population area is totally manageable. It's in the capacity. But that you have to have a union that works. Uh, and I think the commission and the council have really made a great effort. But it's like a train that's running down the tracks, but the wheels have fallen off some of the other, and they're not following. Um, I think you need uh, to recognize, as you say, that 4.5 million residents in Lebanon, more than a million there. Water poor Jordan, 12 million liters of water a day for the refugee camps. Uh, Turkey now the largest refugee hosting country in the world. They need help. They should, they should no longer be treated as middle income countries. They need help now. They need concessionary loans, et cetera. We need to help in the camps. As you say, WFP, UNHCR ran out of money, so they reduced. You cannot have unprecedented conflicts. In my lifetime, I've never known a period when we have so many simultaneous, complex, protracted crises from the western bulge of Africa to the Himalayas. You have Boko Haram in Nigeria in the neighborhood. Somalia's 30-year war continues. Libya and Yemen, unfinished business. Ethno-religious strife in the Central African Republic, South Sudan getting worse every day, Afghanistan, Iran, and the five-year war in Syria. So I, I think that a change in perception, a larger framework, a change in policies, because our visa policies right now are pushing more and more people into the hands of smugglers. We're basically subsidizing smugglers with very bad policies. And the pronouncements that we make, we now have unprecedented anti-migrant sentiment, We all know many of our countries were built on the backs of migrants with the brains and talent of migrants. And, and we have to recognize and come back. We need to do two things. We need to change the very toxic public narrative now on migration. We need to learn to manage diversity because given what we know, global north, global south, aging north, youthful unemployed south, our societies are going to become much more multicultural, multi-ethnic, probably multi-religious. But there are very different ways to do it. There is more the kind of uh, American model, 
where you are very open to everybody, but you're very, very consequent and focused with regard to the acceptance, to the compliance, not only to the constitution, but also uh, to the, uh, to, to, in a broader sense to the values yes. and the lifestyle of the United States. Or you can end up in the other extreme, which is parallel societies. Everybody can go its own way wherever you live. How, how do you see that? Briefly? No, I just, I just think if you're going to focus the debate on identity, you're likely to fail. People don't look like me, they dress differently, they got a funny accent, they practice a different religion. You won't get anywhere with identity. You have to move it from a debate about identity to a debate, can we share some common values and have some common interests? And then it works. Mm -hmm. okay, I think that's you. where we are. Thank you. So now we have, is this also kind of a symbol and metaphor here, we have translations from various languages into various languages. And uh, that provides us with a uh, uh, freedom to uh, also speak in other languages. Simone Boll asked to, although she's, she speaks perfect English, but she wanted to answer her question in German because to deal with all the technicalities, it may be easier. So if you don't understand German, please take headphones and choose uh, a translation. Um, uh, perspective, from your perspective, and I think that this is important, it's not uh, just uh, the uh, uh, perspective uh, of, from above, but it is uh, the perspective uh, of uh, people who see this on a day-to-day -day basis. In Davos, uh, do we think immediately of uh, major refugee problems or problems uh, which are probably much uh, more easy uh, to deal with? But you also have refugees here, and I think uh, this is uh, something that you have to deal with. Yes, we have uh, twice as many refugees as we had the previous year. And uh, we have a lot of uh, developments uh, like others. Now, I think it is very important to realize that uh, we create structures. And we don't just uh, wait until the refugees are recognized as refugees, but uh, from the first uh, day that they come in and look for asylum. That's my experience, that this waiting for decisions, this not doing anything, leads to a situation where people's dignity is simply being uh, trampled underfoot. And this is what leads to to problems. I think that this can lead to problems uh, which we need to deal with. And structures are very important. And I think that we need to work on this and invest in those structures. What should be done differently in your day-to-day -day work with refugees? Well, day-to-day -day work uh, with the refugees uh, is easy, but we've got to start with integration earlier. We've got to have language uh, school, for example, the minute people arrive. In other words, there's too much bureaucracy. I'm thinking of, uh, for example, uh, other measures such as uh, schools. Uh, language schools cost uh, money, of course, and the capacity is often uh, not there. And uh, people don't have uh, asylum or don't get asylum will have to be uh, deported. But I think that if a person can learn other language and can get an education, and even if he goes away, he will be doing something uh, positive when he goes home. What about xenophobia? Do you find a, a lot of tolerance and empathy, or do you also see that uh, people are mm, rejectionist? We don't have very much uh, violence. We don't have any difficulty uh, with this. Uh, and I realize uh, here that uh, there is a very good uh, reception for refugees in Davos. What is difficult, I don't know how to say it, well, we have uh, uh, certain groups uh, where we really have one-to-one -one help, but uh, uh, and then uh, people, of course, they get expensive uh, smartphones or, 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 th or something like that. But I think that nobody leaves their home uh, uh, without a reason. People don't come just to have a good uh, life in uh, Sweden or in Germany or in Switzerland. You've uh, been a very successful entrepreneur, uh, kind of uh, um, hero and star for um, uh, successfully uh, launched uh, businesses. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems that one of the secrets of your successes is a very high percentage of refugees that you have hired. And I read in an interview that you gave that you said basically somebody who uh, has uh, made this decision to leave a country or was forced to make that decision has suffered from so many things and had to, um, um, I mean, be so strong that the likelihood that uh, a refugee is going to work better 
than somebody who comes from a very saturated background is very high. So apart from you know, humanitarian reasons, it seems that you also have uh, very legitimate yeah, it, capitalistic it's, reasons it's to hire for the more business. refugees. That's yeah. interesting. Could you share <coughs> that Absolutely. Experience? And there are many studies that are coming out that um, if you really deeply look into it, and, and you know, it's been said that there are people that are coming that mostly are high-skilled people that they're being forced uh, post to leave. And today, uh, Deputy Prime Minister of Turkey said most skilled ones and actually is the one that are coming to Europe. The remaining ones are staying in Turkey. So you have doctors and engineers and you know, all kinds of backgrounds that people are coming. But the studies are showing is actually in a, in a long term is not a burden, it's actually an opportunity for the society that, um, uh, that you know, uh, the numbers actually make sense. I did not start it from that perspective. Right, I started my business in upstate New York in a very little town in South Edmiston, a very rural area, very farming community, a beautiful community. And Utica is one of the, one of the center where refugees settles, just like uh, Davos, um, they, they settled there. System is a little different, of course, in, in America. And what I did is, once I learned that there's a refugee center there and they were having a hard time to find businesses to you know, to work because they encourage them to work. They only have 30 days to find a job, actually. They have to job, find a job. And we proactively went there and said, can we hire your people? And they were first surprised. Then they said, well, we must tell you, you're about 30 miles away from here, so tra transportation is a challenge. And then the language is going to be a challenge because it's not only one country, there's about 12 different countries that the refugees are coming from. So Nepal, you know, Africa, Afghanistan, you know, Iraq and Syria and all those places. We said these are simple. We put the transportation in place. That's not a big deal. And we will, we will bring some translators. We'll fix that. So this was four or five years ago. I can tell from my experience where these people, when they start working and the society and the people start meeting in the factory floor or the workplace. They start sharing the same goal. They're making a cup of yogurt, every single one of them does. And by doing that, they start building their lives. So I can tell you, I was not expert on this, but I'm just watching because my, they're my friends, they're my colleagues, I work with them every single day, and I am in the factory working every single day too, at least on the first five, six years, that the minute they get a job, that's the day that they stop being a refugee. Mm -hmm. That's the day that they start building their life. Now, five years later, I have colleagues that their daughter is in the top universities in America, in Yale. I have colleagues that they're buying homes. I have colleagues that they step up from the, you know, from the floor to the management position. And there is not one single incident, even though we have 30% of our employees are refugees, not single incident in the factory floor that there was a clash or anything. And South Edmiston is as rural as it can be, you know, before, uh, you know, bringing these people into place. So I see that during this discussion and watching from the distance of political discussions and policy makings and securities, they like to elevate that to a, in, a, in a different level, which is my angle is in a humanitarian level. We are facing one of the biggest crises, as we all know, and I've been to Lesbos, I've been to, uh, you know, where people live, and I, I know their stories, and the suffering, the, the suffering that is going on right now is very deep and very big. Now, as a humanity, we have a decision to make. We, we either going to avoid it or discuss it on the short-term, you know, solutions, or we're going to learn from the past and we're going to make a decision that in the long run, not only for the Europe, but for the world and for the humanity, this is an issue that must be treated in a very, very special way and very, very comfortable way. And I said, we cannot let this to only to the governments and, and NGOs. Business and entrepreneurs must enter here. If I have done this with a startup in a yogurt factory, this could be done in anywhere. And not only by employing it. We have problems in the, in the refugee camps. We have problems on the transportation. We have issues on the integration. We have issues on the registration. We are dealing with this today's issue with the 1940s and 1950s standards. No innovation has come to this place. Yeah. 
And the refugees themselves are using this today, tomorrow's uh, you know, uh, technology, but yet the way that we are handling it is, is really old. Yeah. So I reached out to see who else is doing this, and, and finally I made a decision that how can we bring more businesses into this field, and we launched Tent um, Pledge. And you know, there are some cool companies that are doing some cool stuff. Like you're looking at uh, Airbnb providing housing for the aid workers in the, in the you know, troubled area. Or you're looking at LinkedIn, and at least in Sweden started, is how, they, how can they bring the workforce in the needy places and connect it? You know, you're looking at MasterCards, instead of giving up the money, why, that, why can't we do a, a, a debit card, you know, do that? Um, you know, you're looking at uh, Western Unions or, you know, UPS. There are companies that who wants to come into this place, and they already are, and help to the NGOs and governments, not only by providing a better, faster, more uh, productive way, but also shift the mindset on this issue because the businesses and, and the entrepreneurs, they do have that force to bring it to the next level. Thank you very much. I think that's very encouraging. Apart from these positive role models and examples, we also have a lot of public criticism in some of the media, but also mainly in the uh, uh, internet forums and uh, uh, in the bars and on the streets, that this whole refugee discussion is not honest, that we have a lot of taboos, that certain problems may not be raised. And I would like to ask mainly the politicians on the panel, but basically everybody for a short comment about uh, this uh, thesis. And if we look to this uh, recent uh, escalation in Cologne, where we had these uh, attacks and uh, people to try to rape women and things like that. And then the police reported the next day it was a, uh, was a normal New Year's uh, night and no problems, no issues. That seemed to confirm this theory, that they are taboos, that they are dishonest statements with a good intention in order not to stimulate racism and... Uh, xenophobia, but with per perhaps a very bad uh, long-term effect. How do you see that? Are the taboos an invention? Are they real? And if so, what can we do to deal with that? Please. Can, can I start? Um, we've also had these similar problems as in Cologne, in Stockholm. And uh, when I think about it, it's very clear that we have had, unfortunately, sexual sexual harassment of women for many, many, many years. It didn't start with immigration. So, but at the same time, we need to be very clear what is, what is, um, uh, what, what we cannot absolutely, how you cannot absolutely act in Sweden, but that goes for Swedes as well. I think part of those uh, that uh, committed those crimes were criminal gangs because I haven't heard about a, a culture or a religion uh, in which it, it is okay to, to harass women sexually. I don't think there is. No, uh, but I mean, but, we have to be honest, I mean, there is in the at least, uh, uh, I mean, fundamental uh, Islam, there is a different, uh, uh, um, a different image of, of women and a different habit to treat women. I think this we cannot deny, or would you deny that? No, I mean, just it, the extremists, yes. We, we, yeah. ha we have extremists all over the, the place. Uh, you have extremists... Uh, no, but not only but, extremists. But, but in most of the Muslim countries, there are no they, equal rights for women. The, the, absolutely. Yeah. Less rights for women. That's right. But I, I, don't, I haven't heard anything about that it being okay for a Muslim to harass women sexually. No, of course. So that's not within the culture. Uh, and I think we need to separate that and be very clear. Yes, you, you might have problem. It's We cannot say, for example, there's no problem with any immigrants who come to Sweden. Yes, of course, the, the, there is. And and uh, uh, I, I think we, I, I'm very much in line with, with what you said, that we need to show in a country, not show, talk about, and be very clear, these are the values that we stand up for in our country. In our country, it's democracy. 
Is the rule of so law? So just concretely back to equality. the taboos. So would you say that taboos are an invention of kind of, uh, could be could be sometimes that you are a bit afraid, uh, uh, general, to to talk about problems because you you know that there are groups that want to use these problems in another purpose. Yeah. Uh, you have people also in in Sweden or in Germany or in Europe that with, with an ideology that those who come from other countries are, are not as good as we are. Mr. Mm -hmm. Gabriel, would you agree? Is the chance of Deutsch to speak? Absolutely. Because I was a very... froh, wenn Sie die Gelegenheit nutzen. Wir haben so viele... Yes, so we made uh, sure that we had so interpreters, so if you want to use them, uh, then please go ahead. That was too much engaged in politics than in learning English, so that's the, that's the reality. Um, well, of course, uh, there is anxiety uh, when it uh, comes uh, to uh, uh, looking at the problem if you're a liberal or open to, to the world. And when you have uh, existing problems where you have arguments being banded about in society, which uh, really uh, is used to justify their populism. But I think that there are also taboos. Now, we've been talking about sexual violence against uh, women now. And if you look at uh, this in Germany, we do have a massive problem. Six months ago, the Minister of Justice of uh, Germany uh, presented a motion to strengthen uh, the legislation uh, if uh, there are cases uh, of uh, sexual coercion. And uh, that was well before the events in uh, Cologne and all the events uh, that affected uh, women. This draft uh, bill met enormous resistance in the German parliament. It didn't even get a second reading. Now, of course, it is moving on to a second reading now. Why? Because there is an exact, a certain amount of anxiety in uh, the conservative part of the parliament that we would be discriminating against German men by adopting this law. Now, I come from a family. Now, I still remember the times where it was uh, appropriate for the uh, husband uh, to really um, uh, even uh, be to their wives. I come uh, from a, a time when uh, the uh, wife uh, had to ask uh, their husbands if they could go to work. I was in the 70s. My mother had to ask uh, my father if she could work. No, in uh, the uh, question of uh, divorce law, there was a lot of question of whether people had committed uh, uh, an error. Of course, uh, there was a uh, question of guilt. And it was always the women who were forced to, to accept guilt, never the men. Now, I say all this because even if we are very enlightened and even if we are very uh, liberal, we are not that enlightened. But we think that this is progress and we expect people in our society to adopt uh, these uh, principles. Now, but I think that we shouldn't uh, believe that people who have always been against uh, immigration tend to be uh, not necessarily people who are at the forefront of women's emancipation. I'm a social uh, democrat. I believe in uh, the uh, good of uh, people, but I'm a bit uh, surprised uh, by these developments. But what isn't acceptable is uh, that we should be allowed to talk about things. Perhaps uh, we don't want to use the same kind of language as uh, the xenophobes. And I believe that it is not uh, surprising that there are these reactions in my political party. I think five months ago in the uh, SPD, People were saying, we've got to know exactly who we're taking in. Amongst the hundreds of thousands of people who are coming in, there are some people who are perhaps victims, but also perpetrators. There are thousands of uh, people who have uh, war experience, who are fighters. There are thousands of unaccompanied minors who only have made it to, to our country because uh, they have been able to get through through criminal activities and whose experience in life has been there is one thing you cannot uh, do, and that is to work with the police. Secondly, you cannot not uh, really rely on anybody apart from yourself. Now, of course, we have uh, taken in refugees. And we've had to uh, perhaps not looked immediately uh, uh, what uh, they're bringing uh, into the country. 
But of course, uh, there are also people who've been brought in who have uh, loads of problems. We shouldn't delude ourselves. And I think that, therefore, it is a question of how we deal with these issues. Now, of course, we can't just uh, pretend that the problems don't exist. I think realism also means that you've got to, to ensure that uh, only 10 to 15 percent of uh, refugees have qualifications. 80 percent have no qualifications. A growing a part uh, of the refugees uh, are illiterate. A lot of young people coming to Germany amongst the refugees have no training and don't want any training because uh, for this is a kind kind of uh, minor work. They want to be able to go into a proper job uh, so they can uh, le- earn money quickly. So we've got to be realistic and see what uh, kind of challenges we face. And then I think uh, it is much easier to address the real problems. The more unrealistic we are, the more tense people will be and the more difficult it will be to have a proper discussion. And that is why I believe that You don't need to say we're not going to take more people in uh, because we're going to have greater difficulties. It's a question of saying we've got to recognize the problems these people bring in and uh, also um, find solutions. There is perhaps a question of uh, perhaps uh, people's uh, resentment uh, being um, kindled. You know, you've got a lot of people who have... um, become uh, criminals. But how many people have come into the countries? Now, I work on a daily basis with people from different cultural people who've got uh, different religions. And uh, I must uh, say that I've always been treated with respect. And I have only had positive uh, experience working with the refugees. I think it's just much too easy just uh, to brand uh, them as a group and to say uh, there is a reason for all anxieties. Of course, you're right, says uh, Minister Gabriel. That's right. But to simply pretend that the problems don't exist is wrong. No, but I think that we need to analyze this and we've got to to show uh, or we've got to come up uh, and uh, put forward uh, the right arguments. But you've got to make sure that the press doesn't just uh, uh, report on certain things. Perhaps you could say something about uh, the uh, positive side. You're saying that the press only reports negative things, not just in Switzerland, in Germany too. At the moment, uh, that is the case uh, for the time being in the bus, for example, uh, the bus was very full and an old uh, Swiss uh, lady uh, and a young refugee got up to leave her, uh, him, leave her his seat. You know, I think you've got both sides uh, to the picture. I don't think you should uh, just uh, make things uh, more beautiful than they are, but you've got to, to make sure that you create structures to deal with the problems. Is, it, is this kind of, there are taboos that cannot be reported. Is this the lie? Or is it the other way around? Uh, perhaps you can give us all a... These people, all these people are very right. I'm going to give it to you in exact data on that. Uh, more than 750,000 people that passed through Serbia, we had only nine felonies committed by those guys. Only nine criminal deeds. There were dozens of infringements, but not a big deal. Less than Serbs, less than all of us do it every single day and we had no problems with them we had no problems at all and i wanted just to say that it's what we speak about it here we all agree on that but uh, i don't think that we are majority in in europe and i don't think that we are a kind of mainstream today in europe and uh, i i was listening very carefully to zygmunt gabriel's words And uh, you know that even my political party and my country, we supported always Angela Merkel and Germany, whatever they asked from us. I think that we did our best to deliver on that. And I think that we were very cooperative, Zygmar, more than all the others. But I wanted to say something. Let us analyze three points that Zygmar was mentioning. Just not more than a minute. First of all, yes, Europe need to do something in Syria, and neighboring countries. Whether it, it will bring some results or not, we still don't know. Of course, we need, to, we need to do it. Then you mentioned protection of EU borders. It won't work. It won't work. You can't protect Greek borders. You can't do anything in Greece. And we all know that. And we all know that nobody knows what we're going to do on that. And I'm saying to you that now there are new ideas. I got a letter from Mira Cerar, my friend, my uh, prime minister colleague from Slovenia. And he was with 
Angela Merkel several days ago. And they're all trying with their own initiatives to resolve the problem. Now we see that Macedonian Greek borders where we can stop that influx. We'll be helpful on that as well. We'll be very supportive. If you ask me, it won't be working. We need, they need to make more pressure on EU partners. And we need to deal with these people. These people are not worse than we are. There are some, many of them that are better than we are. And we need to have them because we are not going to stop them. You have today smugglers between Macedonia and Serbia because we don't accept those Moroccan and Algerian guys to the amount that we used to. And now it's 700 euros to 100 to, to 1,200 euros that you have to pay to local smugglers to bring them into Serbia. And the same guys do it to, to Croatia. We need comprehensive and decisive solution. What are we going to do? Otherwise, we'll face terrible political, economic, and all the, others prob and all the other problems in an entire Europe. Yeah, I think we, thank you very much. We, we, we should not and will not discuss today immigration because it's happening, it's a fact, we have to deal with it, and we have to make it a success. So it is the question, how successful are we with regard to integration and what can be improved? And here we have the tremendous opportunity to have two uh, people from Davos uh, who can share with us uh, perhaps some very uh, personal and concrete examples how it feels as a refugee here in Davos. Philip Bryan from Uganda, you are living here in Davos now for four years, uh, working as an automotive engineer. And on your right is Nishanta Pereira from Sri Lanka. Um, you are here for less than a year. And uh, it would be very interesting to get a very brief and concrete um, assessment. Is there more xenophobia? Is there more tolerance and help? How do you feel in Davos as a refugee? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Philip Bryan, and I come from a small town of Malindi on the East African coast, having been raised in a small humble home by a single mother. My mother always told me to always be thankful for things brought my way positively unexpected, and I always be grateful for them, despite of the challenges I always face in the world. First and foremost, I would like to, to thank the Swiss government for having granted me an opportunity to be an asylum seeker. And secondly, I would like to thank the organizing committee for having given me an opportunity to speak on behalf of the refugees and share my story this wonderful evening. I happened to come in Switzerland four years ago and I happened, to seek, uh, I happened to seek asylum as a political refugee. I can't say it was a smooth sail for me in the beginning, having, been, ha having come from Africa, but I was warmly and heartily welcomed. One thing I can never forget is the taste of the Swiss cheese and the chocolates, <laughs> which really came in handy. I was given the basic, the basic necessities of life, like good food, good shelter, it having been called, and by that time, the world-class medication. Unlike my brothers who live in Calais, northern France. Having come in in 2011 and stayed in an asylum center, as my request, was finally granted after a long wait of three and a half years. Some of the people may not really understand the feeling and the situation for having waited three and a half years to be granted asylum. But I can always compare it to doing jail time. I happened to experience various challenges, having left back a loving family, friends, a well-paying job, and a good life, which finally vanished through the air as I began a new life. 
a new life which came with Christmas without family, not being able to celebrate Thanksgiving with my family and friends, and which re always revolved on eating, sleeping, watching TV, and taking routine walks. As we refugees come from different, different backgrounds, ethnic groups, societies, I personally happened to face challenges as the future became unpredictable while I was staying in the asylum center. Integration within the community didn't come that easy as we stayed six to eight people in a 10 to 12 feet room. We usually had physical fights here and there and having come from different backgrounds that really painted a violent image to us asylum seekers as the asylum center was then shifted away from the town to the town outskirts. Some, uh, some natives looked at us as they are feeding on our taxes with that kind of attitude and saw us as violent people. Asking questions like, why did you really come to Switzerland? Forgetting the people having lost their lives at the sea, that never stopped others from using the same route, coming from Africa, trying to escape from the political situations they always faced back home. Some people, when they always see an asylum seeker, they always tend to think that we never have dreams. And I happen to have a 14-year-old colleague of mine. We usually share the same room. We share the same plate. We ate the same food. And in our daily talk, I happened to ask him. Actually, it really hit me hard that I had to ask him, how do you find the situation? What will you want to be when you, always, uh, when, you, when you grow up? And surprisingly, he happened to tell me that he really wanted to become a heart surgeon. I can't really imagine how that felt that he had a dream of being a heart surgeon, which could always be a dream to give back medically to the people in the community. I also have a dream. I had a profession, and I'm out there trying to, to pursue my, prof my profession. As most of the people in the human race always have a dream. Finally, I would like to ask the government, the policy makers, the I would like to ask the government, the policy makers, the heads of states out there, to always consider the time the asylum seekers always spend while the asylum applications are being processed. Just because there are some people out there who have spent more than six years without having any, any positive result or any negative result that they never know what tomorrow holds for them. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Nishanta, would you share with us for three minutes your experience of your, your view? Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am Nishanta Pereira, who reborn in Switzerland. First, I would like to thank to the organizing committee from all my hearts for inviting me to the, this great event. I like to share my experience as a person who became a refugee due to human rights investigations. When I was in Sri Lanka, I performed my duties as chief investigator for the serious violation of human rights. I have personally conducted over 1,200 cases pertaining to, pertaining to murders, disappearances, and abductions done by politicians, armed and police personnel, and other vigilant groups. 
Due to these investigations, I and my family face grave danger with death threats and several har harassment from the government bodies and its secret killing groups. Some of the high profile cases I in investigated such as the assassination of five students in Trincomalee in 2006, which created a serious hue and cry locally and internationally, and 150 mass graves in central part of Sri Lanka. In these 150 mass graves, I unco uncovered evidence to the effect that the most powerful person in charge of national security, as well the very close related to the previous head of country, former Inspector General of Police, and current second in charge of a Sri Lankan armed forces to have been directly involved in this above assassinations. Due to this investigation, these some of most powerful persons ordered to government sponsored killing groups to shut me down. I was in hiding at the time, away from my family and unidentified personnel uh, have been intimidating my, and th threatening my family and relations inquiring my whereabouts. I have been received death threats continuously in this period. Same time, this group killed and kidnapped all important witnesses as well as them destroy all investigation documents pertaining to these inquiries. They have even inquired about my children and information regarding their school in Venus. At the time, my wife was pregnant with our third child. Due to this stress, she was under immense pressure, and the gynecologist even said the child was not growing properly. They suggest terminate the pregnancy. However, we managed to get a second opinion from a different specialist doctor who treated my wife and with immense difficulty she gave birth to a child. In this very dangerous situation, I forwarded my case to the Swiss Embassy in Colombo and they were swift in their response to help me and my family to escape from the dire circumstances faced at the time in Sri Lanka. Within a reasonable period, the Swiss government granted us refugee status in 2015. In the beginning of our refugee life in Davos, we faced some challenges due to language barriers, the cold climate, and homesickness for my family and friends. But the staff of the asylum centers and integration projects helped us on the way to integration into the society. They gave us a very good lifestyle, safety, as well as language learning facilities. Within a very short period, I learned enough German to manage daily routines. My children integrated a lot faster than I did. They picked up language, made friends, and now they are attending public schools. And even they're learning how to ski. <laughs> Some of our neighbors are voluntarily helping my kids to improve their language skills and even do their school homeworks. The community has welcomed us being warm and supportively helped us to settle down and to forget our bad experience. As an ex accepted refugee, I have a very broad responsibility to serve Switzerland and to respect its society, culture, and customs. We are very proud and privileged to make a new home in Switzerland and honored to live with dignity and respect again. Finally, we would like to thank Switzerland and its people for caring us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So we have now just 15 minutes less left because we have to end 7.45 sharp because most of our panelists have accepted dinner invitations that start at 7.30, so they can afford to be 15, 20 minutes late, but not more. So I would like to bring up one um, topic, um, and that is if we want to improve integration, if we want to um, get better, from whom can we learn? And I had a very um, interesting conversation a couple of days ago with the president of the European Parliament, Martin Schulz, and the president of the Israeli par parliament, Yuri Edelstein. Israel is a country that has integrated uh, since its foundation um, in 48, um, 3.5 million refugees. 
that is in proportion to its total number of uh, uh, inhabitants, uh, almost as if Germany uh, would integrate 40 million. So compared to the challenges ahead of us, much, much bigger, and it was a very successful integration. So um, we discussed among the two uh, presidents, could Europe, could countries like Sweden, like Germany, who have to integrate most of the immigrants now, could they learn concretely from Israel? Could they cooperate from is with Israel? Could there be even a kind of organized uh, political cooperation between Israel and some of the European countries? I would like to ask uh, William Swing whether you think it's a realistic idea or just uh, uh, dream dreams. Look, I think... I think the weakest aspect of our migration policy generally is the integration aspect. If we don't succeed with integration, then we will fail utterly. Um, some, some people have said publicly, we love the country, the country doesn't love us. So it's going to depend on the warmth of the welcome and the comprehensiveness of the integration program. We have done cultural orientation programs for refugees for the US, Canada, Australia, and other immigration countries for at least 35 years to give them some sense already before they start out what they can expect. Now, of course, with the flows that have come into Europe now, you wouldn't have that opportunity. But once you get there, several things are very important. Um, again, you need to involve local community. You need to involve uh, church, synagogue, mosque, uh, uh, social, other elements of civil society. There needs to be a strong emphasis on language learning, and Germany's done that very well. Germany's been saying that those families coming to join out of Turkey and elsewhere, they really need to get at least a, a rudimentary understanding of the language so they'd be comfortable when they arrive. <coughs> We've been training Myanmar refugees in the northern caps of Thailand to go to Japan, teaching them rudimentary Japanese. When they arrive there, they can order meals, et cetera. Then they go into full immersion. Job, livelihood get them as quickly as possible into the economy. As, as one said earlier, it's the job that makes the difference. And then they will very quickly start paying back because they're going to be paying taxes. Um, finding, finding ways to, you should be encouraging a diaspora policy. The diaspora communities in a country can be very helpful. And there's no contradiction between being fully integrated in the local society, in the host society, and yet still very active in the diaspora, sending money back home, $435 billion a year, twice the amount of foreign aid, about equal to all foreign direct investment. So you can contribute to both. We've got to stop thinking about migration as movement from point A to B, end of story. We're living in a mobile world, a digital world. Four billion people connect to the internet. Free flow of everything, free flow of capital goods and services, but someone said earlier, We've got the policies of the post-World War II, and we've got to change that. Okay, may I, may I simply now ask to each panelist a yes and no question. Uh, would you think, uh, would you encourage a concrete political cooperation between Israel and Europe with regard to refugees, or would you tend to say it's uncomparable? The refugees that went to Israel were all Jews. They wanted to, they were very, very uh, happy to become uh, citizens of this particular country, and for that reason it's uncomparable. So are you more skeptical, it's a dream, or are you positive and think this is going to work and we should do it? Yes or no? Let's go from uh, right to left. <laughs> From left to right. <laughs> uh, from the audience perspective, okay. it's from right to left. <laughs> yes, I think. It's okay. Possible. More skeptical, but I'll do my best. Okay. I think watch Turkey. Turkey is doing great. You know, nobody talked about it here. Is 2.2 million, million refugees came into Turkey. They just passed a law that you can actually work in Turkey as a refugee. Only small portions of the refugees are staying in the camps, but most of them are open into the society. Their kids are going to the school, they pass the law. And their kids are more preferred, I shouldn't say, it's easier for the refugee kids to go to university in Turkey than the Turkish students. Easier go to the hospital than the, because the Turkish citizen pays a copay and, 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 and refugee doesn't. So, I am a little surprised that when we are looking at the old you know, um, examples, we're not looking at what's happening in Jordan, in Turkey, and maybe in Lebanon. Okay. The people in those countries are also 
receiving a lot of people coming into their communities. There are cities that 50% are refugees. 50%. That means that somebody's job is going somewhere else. That means that hospitals are more full. That means that the jobs that they're taking from the other people. But yet, the government is actually doing the smart things on this issue. Why? Because they said, if we are going to isolate them, it's going to cause more problems. I wonder, I don't want to solve it by myself, I want to solve it as a society. And I think it's interesting to watch them, there's a lot of learning there, and I'm watching it, and I, I, I think on this issue, is Turkey, and is, Turkey is, is doing a really good job. Um, it was a little longer than a yes, but I have to admit, it was an interesting answer. Yeah. So, <laughs> Mr. Swing. This will be a also a bit longer. <laughs> Because it's, uh, I think, to you with, think yes. with, with, you, no. You, with all the respect, I, I think the question is is, is not really legitimate. Uh, legitimate. It's not right. But because we have to keep focus on what is important. Sorry, exactly, why is the question exactly, not exactly what you mentioned? You mentioned, you mentioned we need uh, schools. Need uh, sorry, kids need to go to school. Adults need to go to job. You need housing. Keep focus on the on the on the on the important thing. And yes, I would be surprised if there's nothing to be learned from Israel, but not only Israel, I can learn from Canada, I can learn from Norway, I can learn from other countries. And, and that, uh, I think that is more important. So, yep. so, so let's keep on, and that, can I just add one thing? I think the civil society is crucial. We need to bring in, uh, politicians need to take responsibility, business need to be there, of course, doing a great job, also in Sweden, but civil society is crucial. The more human contact, the better. And civil society can provide human contact uh, like nobody else. So I want to bring in civil society in, with a much more uh, clear pers perspective on, you, on civil society. Okay, thank you. Sorry for asking a legitimate question, but nevertheless, I would like it's to repeat it to Mr. Gabriel <laughs> because my question was not whether we should only cooperate with Israel, but my question was whether we should take the offer that the Israeli government has made to help European countries to integrate successfully. Minister Gabriel, yes or no? <laughs> only, only, only journalists think that you can answer complicated uh, questions with yes or no. Uh, but, but, but nevertheless, never the, nevertheless, of course, it's interesting, but maybe in a different way that you mentioned. I know very well how difficult it was and it is in Israel to integrate Jews from Africa in a society which were built mostly from immigrants out of Europe. And there, I don't know how it's the situation today, but some years ago there was xenophobia. Um, So-called white Jews did not want to bring their kids in the same school where Jews from other parts of Africa were integrated. So we should ask them how the country was able to overcome these cultural differences. And we should also discuss with other countries, but in reality, the pragmatic issues in Germany are crystal clear. The question is ne not that we do not know the answers. The, the, the difficulty is, are we, are, do we, are we willing to do what the lady from Davos said, to start, for example, teaching German from the early days of arrival? Or do we discuss it in a way where we should say, ah, maybe it's a pull factor? So this is, this is the really issue. Second, are we willing to invest five to eight billion euros in Germany per year for, for employing teachers, um, building kindergartens, childcare? Um, are we willing to have a public sector for employment because we know that many people which arrived in Germany will not be able to work in a high-skilled and high-efficient industry. So it's a question of political willingness, not that we have to study a lot. We have to study a lot in cultural issues, how to deal with religion. Then, of course, we, have a, we, have a, we must discuss about religious issues. Um, this, this was made in, in Europe since the French Revolution. And this is one of the main differences from the Arab world to the European world. 
discussing is not meaning to, to blame people for their religion, but discussing. Okay. And I think, so this is a question of willingness, not a question of knowledge. Okay, thank you. It's now 4.45 sharp. Uh, feeling provoked by this statement that only journalists can think that <laughs> questions can be answered by yes and no. I want to conclude also with regard to our time frame by another yes and no question. And this is even uh, putting some moral pressure on you. And this question goes as follows. The, pr the problem is, to be very honest with you, we wanted to do it, but uh, since we had to conclude 15 minutes earlier than originally planned because of these uh, um, uh, agenda constraints, we thought it's better to uh, uh, give the panelists uh, and also the two refugees the time. But if you have a question, I step back with mine and you go ahead. Um, the question also. On Friday, I give you the invitation. We have a big meeting. There we continue after the open forum in the Reformierten Kirche to this follow the discussion because it's not in much time. I invite you also for a manifestation on Saturday with refugees. My question is, when I come, I come from Lesbos and I saw the people, the volunteers make the big job. Not the European committee were there, only volunteers. I come there all the time. My question is, the Pope said, this economy kills and produces refugees. What we have to do to change these politics that not 60 millions have to fly from their home because we have the war, we have the climate problem, human rights, and we have the economy. My question is, Mr. Gabriel, all these people, what we have to do that we are not a part of the problems, that we have a politic of a part of the solution. In other ways, we have 100 million okay. refugees. Gabriel, this is the question. Or who wants to ask, answer it? The biggest, the biggest issue to stop the war in Syria, but therefore you need difficult countries like Saudi Arabia and Iran, because uh, the, the, this is a war not only inside Syria, it's a war between also warlords which are financed and supported by these countries. And therefore, I think the, 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 uh, the international negotiations here in, in Switzerland uh, between Russia, America, Turkey, Jordan, uh, the war parts of Syria and Saudi Arabia and Iran is the most important step to, to come to a solution. Uh, but you know, it's very difficult and it's not, it, it cannot be made uh, from run, one day to the other. And I'm, I'm afraid that after we solve, solve Syria, there will be other uh, reasons for for leaving the country, so we have to deal with the refugee issue issues. I think for a long time. Thank, thank you. A reality is very concrete, and we have invited to our hometown Potsdam a family from Syria with two kids living there for many months, and that has changed a lot of uh, things and prejudice around in our neighborhood because it's such a positive experience. My question, the yes and no question to conclude to all the panelists, could you imagine to take a refugee family? Yes? Yeah, I, I've been a contact person for a refugee, and that was one of the most uh, good experiences I had in my life. I, yes, I, I do to the, the same with the family from Syria, okay. which is heavily wounded uh, in the family. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Yes. Didn't do it, but didn't do it, but you could imagine. Ready. Yeah. Yes, of course. Isn't that an encouraging uh, end? Thank you very much for your attention. Attention. Thank you.